J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with Yes, Yes, Yes in Your Eyes. Snowy white Easter rabbits, gaily colored Easter eggs, flower bedecked Easter bonnets, red, blue, white, green, yellow. Everywhere you turn on Easter, the keynote is color. In fact, that's one reason why so many thousands of families today choose a beautiful jello dessert for dinner. Jello is as bright and colorful as an Easter parade, a perfect picture of tempting goodness, the center of attention at every table. And believe me, it's every bit as appetizing as it is attractive. Jello, you know, comes in six brilliant, shimmering colors. And whichever you choose, you get a world of swell, delicious flavor, rich, tangy flavor, and a refreshment that rivals the ripe, juicy fruit itself. So enjoy this grand dessert often. Ask your grocer for several packages of Jell-O tomorrow. And when you buy, look for the big red letters on the box. They spell Jell-O, and Jell-O spells a treat. was There's Yes, Yes in Your Eyes, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you a man who last Sunday gave us his interpretation of the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Now, I will not say that his performance surpassed Charles Lawton's. Well, no. I will not even say that his performance equaled Charles Lawton's. Well, uh... In fact, let's forget about Lawton and bring you Jack Benny. <laughs> Uh, Jello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, when you criticize my performance last Sunday, well, that's just silly. That's like trying to run down the Gettysburg Address. It can't be done. <laughs> In other words, Jack, you feel that you made history last Sunday night. Definitely. Now, I'll concede I can't become a great dramatic actor in one week, but you'll have to admit that when I played Quasimodo the Hunchback, I got off to a flying start. Well, uh, Jack, to tell you the truth, I was only kidding, because I thought you gave a swell performance, and I thought Orson Welles was excellent as the King of France. Oh, he was, he was, and he's a very fine teacher, too. He certainly is. Oh, by the way, Jack, uh, what are you paying him for lessons? I don't know, Don, I'll just wait till he sends me a bill, and then we'll get down to business. <laughs> At that time, we'll see who's the better actor. <laughs> but you know, Don, a lot of people stop me during the week and mention how much they enjoyed our program. I wonder if the newspapers had any comment on it. I didn't run across anything, Jack. Uh, did you happen to see anything, Dennis? No, I didn't, Mr. Benny. Well, you'd think that... Say, Phil, uh, you didn't see anything in the papers about our last Sunday's broadcast, did you? There was nothing in the racing form about it. <laughs> well, of course there wasn't. But you know, fellas, with Orson Welles on the show, you'd think that some newspaper would have... Oh, picked... say, Jack, come to think of it, I did hear that some columnist covered it last Monday. I think it was Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan? Well, what did he have to say? I didn't read it myself, but they tell me it was quite favorable. Quite favorable? Don, listen to this. I got a copy of it right here. <laughs> Get this. Well, for heaven's sake, if you got a copy of it with you, why did you ask everybody if they'd seen anything in the paper? Because I didn't want to be a ham unless it was absolutely <laughs> necessary. Now... <laughs> oh. Get a load of this. Here's what Ed Sullivan says. It says, the Jell-O program last night was highlighted by the appearance of Mr. Orson Welles, whose performance as the king in The Hunchback of Notre Dame was, uh, while Jack Benny, <laughs> while Jack Benny gave a vivid characterization as Quasimodo the Hunchback. Mr. Benny's groans and grunts were the greatest thing since Strangler Lewis retired. <laughs> How's that? Gee, that's swell, Mr. Benny. You darn tootin', that Strangler Lewis was no slouch. <laughs> There's a lot more here, fellas, but that gives you an idea. Oh, that's very nice, Jack. Uh, I'd like to have a copy of that review. Here, Don, take this. 
I happen to have another one in my pocket. Here. May I have a look at it, Mr. Benny? Yes, Dennis, you can have this other one. Hey, Dennis, uh, let me have that clipping when you get through with it. I want to pass it around to the boys in my band. Okay. Here, Phil, I happen to have seven or eight more copies with me. <laughs> uh, pass these around. Oh, boy, what a guy. He gets his name in a column and buys every newspaper in town. I didn't do it to be egotistical. I just bought those papers because, well, because I believe in buying things. You know, I'm trying to bring back prosperity. Well, if you ever lose enough, you're just the guy that can do it. <laughs> oh, stop, Phil. You're just jealous because I got a little publicity. Now, let me tell you something, Phil. You, you'd get good notices, too, if you try to improve yourself like I do. I mean, instead of giving us those hot swing tunes all the time, why don't you play something more elevating? You mean them classics? Them or those. That's what I mean. <laughs> Would add a little dignity to the program Well, I can give you that kind of stuff Just name it You want something from William Tell Or Rigoletto Or Fawcett? That's Fox <laughs> Fawcett Something from Fawcett, Phil Is a glass of water You wouldn't recognize that either <laughs> What a band you know, Phil, you've got three violin players who sit there week after week, play piece after piece, and no one can hear them. Well, that's because my brass section is too loud. Well, for heaven's sake, why don't you make them quiet down? They got something on me. <laughs> well, as long as you're on a spot, I forgive you. But it just seems a shame that you have... Well, look who's here. Hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hello, fellas. Well, hello, oh, Mary. Hello. Nice to have you back. Well, you hear that applause, Mary? Everybody missed you last Sunday. How are you feeling, Mary? Oh, I'm much better, Don, but I was a pretty sick girl, believe me. Oh, boy, did I have a cold. Pretty bad, huh? I'll say. Sugar Plum said I had a temperature of 103. Sugar Plum? That's my doctor. Oh. <laughs> Pet names already, huh? What is this, a romance? Not yet, but if I have a relapse, I'll get him. <laughs> I see. So you're kind of stuck on your doctor, eh, Mary? Gee, right now I wouldn't eat an apple for a thousand dollars. Well, let me tell you something, Mary, and this is for your own protection. Don't have a doctor around just because he's good looking. Does this fellow know anything about medicine? Does he? He graduated from Warner Brothers. <laughs> oh. Well, that studio is practically the Johns Hopkins of the West. But I'll tell you one thing, Mary. You better take care of yourself from now on. Yes, sir. We need you on this program. That's right. Yeah, you should have been here last Sunday, Mary, and watched Jackson make a monkey out of himself. Make a monkey out of myself? That's right. Dennis, you don't have to agree with everybody. <laughs> Say, Mary, uh, you heard the show last week. I did all right with that Charles Lawton part, didn't I? Sugar Plum didn't like it. Who cares about Sugar Plum? <laughs> I asked you what you thought of it. I thought it was all right, but gee, Jack, ever since you got this acting bug, you've gone haywire. What do you mean? You should see the way he walks around Beverly Hills, fellas, all dressed up and carrying a cane. A cane? Why, certainly I was carrying a cane because I hurt my leg in Yosemite. What were the spats for, bandages? <laughs> Mary, I went in the store to buy a cane and there was a special on. Cane spats and a pound of peanut brittle, $4.50. <laughs> Anyway, I wasn't trying to show off. A lot of actors wear spats. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Nobody wears spats in Southern California. It's too hot here. Without socks? What are you talking about? <laughs> Besides, this had nothing to do with my performance last Sunday. Say, uh, Mary, did you see one of those clippings about Jack from Ed Sullivan's column? Did I? Jack pasted them on Easter eggs and hit them all over my house. <laughs> Mary, I just did that to take your mind off your sickness, that's all. <laughs> now, Dennis. Yes, please? Uh, let's have a song and put an end to all this heckling. Gee, I meant to tell you, Mr. Benny, I got a pretty sore throat today, and I don't think I'll be able to sing. Oh, that's too bad. But why didn't you tell me sooner? Find time to tell me. Now I can't bring in another tenor. Yeah. I'm not so dumb, am I? <laughs> No, yet not so deep as a well But you put me in a spot here Oh, no, he hasn't, Jackson Mary and I can sing a song, can't we, Mary? Yeah, Harrison Livingston Anything from Dardanella to Fawcett <laughs> Well, we're stuck But we'll have to make the best of it Hit it, boys <laughs> Well, 
Well, it looks like I'm in the doghouse. Yes, Phil, you pulled the bloomer. Well, I'll say this. This thing of being crowded behind that eight ball... Is more than just a rumor. Oh, now look, honey, look. All I can say is... I know I haven't any sense of humor. Well, what if I did stay out kind of late? Yeah, but you were coming from another date. Well, holy smoke, can't you take a joke? Okay, Phil, look. How about that lipstick on your tie? Honey, don't say lipstick. You know, I'm crazy about cherry pie. Holy smoke. Well, can't you take a joke? Look, if you don't believe me, why don't you sit down and write to Beatrice Fairfax? That's what I'm going to do. And be sure while you're writing, honey, that you only give her the bare facts. She'll say I'm cuckoo. Now, wait. Now, you know I didn't mean to tell those lies. I know. It must have been two other guys. Well, holy smoke. Can't you take a joke? I don't know why you're always squawking. After all, I saw you out with another man. Oh, Phil, don't be silly. That was just my Uncle Dan. Oh, holy smoke. Can't you take a joke? Well, then tell me something. Where did you get that great, big, beautiful limousine? Oh, I won that out of one of those claw machines. Uh, oh, holy smoke. Can't you take a joke? You know, Mary, the reason I check up is because I'm jealous. Yeah. I'm awfully jealous of everything you do. Oh, Phil, look, I don't want those handsome fellas. All I want is you. Gee, you kids are cute. Well, now, look, let's let all this silly talk cease. Well, gee, can't an uncle just kiss his knee? There you go. Holy smoke. Can't, can't you take, take a joke? That was Holy Smoke, played by the orchestra, with a vocal refrain by Harris and Livingston. This sterling team will appear tomorrow night at Barney's Beanery on the Dollar Dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and now, ladies and gentlemen... Gee, Miss Livingston, you sang that number swell. Thank you, Dennis. You too, Mr. Harris. You're great. Thanks. Gosh, you've got a voice like a lark. Yes, lark meaning the train that runs between here and San Francisco. <laughs> Toot, toot. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a surprise announcement. Mr. Don Wilson, that eminent American playwright, has written another of his famous one-act dramas entitled Love's Young Dream. Take it, Mr. Wilson. The time is spring, and the scene is a honeymoon cottage all covered with ivy. It is the new home of Mr. and Mrs. Oliver J. Snodgrass, who have just eloped and been married. As we pick them up, the happy couple is arriving at their little love nest for the first time. Curtain music. Well, here we are, darling. 33 Maple Street, our own little home. Oh, it's beautiful, sweetheart. We'll be so happy here. Yeah. Gee, just think. Twenty minutes ago, your name was Myrtle Moonfinkel. <laughs> and now, and now... I'm a snot in the grass. That's snot grass. Oh. Gee, our own little home. Well, let's go inside, honey. You go first. No, you go first, Oliver. <laughs> no, I don't want to. You go first. No, no, you go first. Three hours later. Ah, honey, you go first. <laughs> oh, let's go in together. All right. <laughs> oh, Myrtle, stop. <laughs> Gee, Myrtle, isn't it romantic eloping? Nobody knows we're married except us. <laughs> Gosh, we're all alone. Oh, Oliver, I love you so much. And I love you too, darling. But what will your mother say when she finds out we're married? I don't care what she says. You're mine, Myrtle Moonfinkel, and nothing can part us. <laughs> Come, darling, I will show you all the rooms in the house. Oh, Oliver. <laughs> Myrtle, stop acting like a darn fool. <laughs> but, Oliver, I'm worried about your mother. Please call her and tell her we're married. All right, dear. If it'll make you any happier, I will. Oh, Myrtle, darling, you've made me the happiest man in the world. And we'll never be separated, will we? Never. Kiss me, honey bunch. My dream man. Hello? Pardon me, Myrtle. Hello, Ma, this is Oliver. I got a surprise for you, Ma. I... What's that? No, no, I can't be home for dinner. Now, look, Ma, I got a surprise for you. I... 
You're having what? Oh, tell her about us, Oliver. I will, I will. You're having what for dinner? You are? Oh, boy, I'll be right home. Goodbye, Myrtle. I gotta go home to dinner. But, Oliver, we're just married. I can't help it. Ma's having jello for dessert. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. I'll see you in the morning. Oliver! So you see, ladies, the moral of the story is never start your honeymoon without Jell-O. What happened to Myrtle Moonfinkel may happen to you or you or you. So always insist on genuine Jell-O and live happily ever after. I thank you. <laughs> uh, very good, Don. That was one of the best plays you've ever written. Yeah, that was swell, Don. Congratulations. Yes, sir. Oh, Andy. Hello, Andy. I didn't see you. Well, hello, Andy. Good to see you. Hey, I'm glad you dropped in, Andy. You don't get around as often as you used to. Well, I got a brand new suit for Easter, so I thought I'd come up and model it for you. Oh. Not bad for $22.50, eh? $22.50? Yep, suit, cane, spats, and a pound of peanut brittle. <laughs> I believe I know where you got it. Say, Mary, Mary, what do you think of Andy's new suit? He looks like he fell off the cover of a Rube joke book. <laughs> he does not. He looks very smart. Although the pants seem to be a little tight. Aren't the pants too tight for you, Andy? Tight? I went out for some fresh air this morning, and when I bent over to tie my shoelace, I got it. <laughs> well, the audience didn't, but let it go. <laughs> <laughs> well, go on a diet, Andy. You'll be all set. Say, Andy, the next time you want to get a new suit, let me take you to my tailor. He's a little extreme, but he's terrific. A little extreme? Phil, the lapels on your coat have a bigger wing spread than the China Clipper. <laughs> well, that's the way I like them. Anyway, it's the latest style. I saw it in Esquire. Oh, you did? Listen, Phil, you never saw anything in Esquire that didn't say, oh, I thought my husband was in Philadelphia under it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Andy. Hey, Andy, where are you? Here I am, Buck. Oh. Now, Andy, the next time you want to get a suit of clothes, let me take you to my tailor. He'll not only do a great job, but he's one of the sweetest and most lovable guys in the world. Why well, didn't you say that for Father's Day? <laughs> Mary, I'm not referring to my father. He never made a suit in his life. Then what was he doing in the store in Waukegan with his legs crossed? Playing Indian? <laughs> oh, don't be smart just because you had a cold. He wasn't playing Indian. I knew an Indian once that wore a blanket with a belt in the back. That's very interesting, <laughs> Dennis. <laughs> Now, go sit down. So much for your dialogue. Now, Andy, stick around. Phil's going to play in a minute, and then we'll have some fun. Uh, sorry, Buck, I can't stay. I'm taking more and part of the Trocadero. Why, Andy, the Trocadero is temporarily closed. The Trocadero bowling alleys? We were there last night. Oh, that's different. I didn't know your Ma and Pa bowled. Oh, well, Ma's all right, but Pa can't stay out of the gutters. <laughs> so long, Buck. So long, Andy. So long. Well, there's one family that has a good time. Say, Phil, as long as you're standing there with a baton in your hand, you might as well direct a number. This ain't a baton, it's a toothpick for a rhinoceros. Wow, there's a Lulu. <laughs> oh, quiet with those comebacks. <laughs> just play something. Oh, Jack, this is terrible. I just happened to think of something. What is it, Mary? You let Andy go home without giving him a copy of Ed Sullivan's column. Gee, I sure did. Oh, keep still. Play, Phil. Everybody thinks they got my goat.
was Do I Love You, played by Phil Harris and his independent orchestra. Independent meaning it's every man for himself, and the last one in is a rotten egg. <laughs> Blues. <laughs> I guess that'll take care of you, Mr. Harris. Well, it's just like they say in the East. Benny tries to be funny, but he's nothing but a straight man for Orson Welles. What? <laughs> who? Who says that in the East? You know who said it. He's on the air every Wednesday night. Oh, you mean the voice of Salapatica? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I happened to hear Mr. Allen's program last Wednesday, and I'd much rather be a straight man for Orson Welles than a perch for an eagle. <laughs> Did you hear his program, Mary? Yeah, and what do you think of Fordham University giving him a bronze plaque for being their favorite comedian? It was very nice. But let me tell you something, Mary. If that plaque is worth over $3, I'll bet $45 it's in the hock shop right now. <laughs> he hasn't got any more sentiment than a mackerel. What do you mean, Jack? Well, listen to this. About five years ago, when we were good friends, I gave Alan a gold watch for his birthday, and I inscribed on it to Fred from Jack with deep affection. Yes? And after one little argument... After one little argument, he runs to the jewelers and has it changed from deep to cheap. <laughs> How do you like that? That was after our first fight. What was the fight about, Jack? What was it about? Alan refused to pay for a suit that Dad made for him. Hey, wait a minute. I thought you said your father didn't make suits. I didn't say my father made that suit. I said Dad. J. Dad and Company. <laughs> Fifth Avenue. Well, if it wasn't your father, why fight with a guy over a strange tailor? Because I worry about everything and shut up. <laughs> now, Dennis, how about a song? I told you I had a sore throat. Oh, yes, I'm all mixed up. Now, where was I? Oh. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a very important announcement to... Hmm, it burns me up. That suit fitted him like a glove. I have a very important announcement to make regarding next week's attraction. Oh, Phil, give me a fanfare, will you? Fanfare? What's that? You know, make with the bugle. Oh, oh, okay. Take it, Butch. <laughs> the best suit he ever had. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce our feature attraction for next week. Next Sunday night, the Benny applauses our food, so do not starve us, players. <laughs> will uh, present their version of the greatest children's classic of all time. None other than Walt Disney's superb Technicolor production, that immortal fairy tale, that pen and ink masterpiece, Fred Allen. I mean, Pinocchio. <laughs> now, inasmuch as Pinocchio will be one of the most important efforts in our current season, we would at this time like to give you a few of the highlights from this great production. First, pardon me. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. Rochester, if I told you once, I told you a thousand times not to call me up in the middle of a broadcast. Well, this is important, boss. I was just leaving the house, so I thought I'd better tell you I put the key under the mat. Now, wait a minute. Who told you you could have the night off? Well, this is a holiday, and I thought I'd take Carmichael to see Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> That's silly. Why would Carmichael go to Grapes of Wrath? He wants to see if it's anything like the book. <laughs> Now, don't give me that stuff. If you want to go out with your girl tonight, you should come right out and say so. Okay, uh, can I go out with my girl tonight? No. Uh, can I go out for just an hour? No. Well, can I invite her over to the house? No. We're in a rut, boss. Let's start over. <laughs> now, Rochester, I don't want to seem harsh or cruel or anything, but you know you were supposed to stay home tonight and mail out those letters. Oh, boss, do you have to send Mr. Sullivan's column to everybody you know? My friends are interested, believe me. I want those letters mailed out tonight, every one of them. And as soon as you're through, you can go out with your girl. That may be too late. She ain't the truest thing in town. <laughs> well, that's your worry. Now, mail out all those letters and be sure to send the out-of-town ones airmail. I ain't got any stamps. No stamps? What did you do with that $10 I gave you this morning to buy him with? Well, I'll tell you, boss, I was mm -hmm. on my way to the drugstore this afternoon to get them, and all the way over I kept saying, stamps, stamps, stamps. Uh-huh. And just before I got there, I stopped in the garage where a friend of mine works. Uh-huh. And the uh, next thing I knew, I was on my knees saying, seven, seven, seven. 
I see. So you lost that $10 shooting craps, eh? We prefer to call it Mississippi Bridge. <laughs> I don't care what you prefer. My $10 you lost is coming out of your next week's salary. The whole $10? Yes, all of it. That's a neat trick if you can do it. <laughs> I can, so don't worry. I'll take $10 out of your salary next week if I have to give you a raise to do it. Now, get busy on those letters, and I'll bring some stamps home with me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. What? Mr. Orson Welles called up about our dramatic lessons tomorrow morning. Our dramatic lesson? Yeah, you're doing Anthony, and I'm Cleopatra. Get out of here. <laughs> lesson for me exclusively, and goodbye. I always have to horn in on everything. Let me see, where were we? Uh, you were about to give us some of the highlights from Pinocchio, but there isn't much time left. Oh, well, anyway, folks, be sure and tune in next Sunday night for our supreme novelty of the season, Pinocchio. Take it, Don. See the wooden puppet who becomes human. Gee, I can walk, and I can talk, too. See Stromboli, the wicked gypsy who kidnaps little Pinocchio. Ah, you cannot escape, Pinocchio. You will make lots of money for me. <laughs> You're a wicked man. Help, help. See Monstro, the largest whale in all the seven seas. Ooh. Are you back to the hunchback? That's an imitation of a whale. See Jiminy Cricket, the tiny insect who becomes Pinocchio's conscience. Chirp, chirp. These are only a few of the many fascinating characters who will entertain you next week in Pinocchio. Play, Phil. And now, ladies, here's your good deed for tomorrow. Delight the family with a new exciting treat, something really original. A novel and delicious jello dessert made with bright, tangy jello and your favorite cereal. It's a perfect dessert for any time at all, for lunch or dinner or for those late evening snacks, or for a grand one dish Sunday supper. And it's wonderfully easy to make. Simply dissolve one package of cherry jello or any of the other red flavors in one pint of hot water. Turn into a shallow pan and chill until firm. Then cut into tiny, glistening cubes and place in cereal dishes. And on top, pile generous quantities of any cold cereal such as Post Toasties or Grape Nuts Flakes. And there's enjoyment of plenty. A delightfully different dessert, shining cubes of rich crimson jello, topped off with your favorite cereal. So try this new jello dessert tomorrow. It's really swell. This is the last number of the 25th program in the current jello series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Say, uh, Mary, where did Jack go? He had to rush over to Orson Welles' program. They're putting on a play, June Moon. Oh, that's a legitimate play, isn't it? Well, it's supposed to be, but Jack will take care of that. Good night, <laughs> folks. J E L L O. And here's more fun and enjoyment for you. Tune in every Tuesday night for another swell half hour of Jell-O entertainment, the famous Aldrich family. See your local paper or movie and radio guide for time and station. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>